Many people think, oh, it's too hard, I'm never going to save enough money, I won't bother. And so the advice I frequently give to younger people is start straight away. That's John Cowling, the CEO of the Australian Shareholders Association, and I'm Phil Muscatello. Welcome to this bonus episode of Shares for Beginners. I've mentioned the association many times on this podcast and the great work that they do. I'm a member, and I strongly suggest that you join too. It's $130 a year for online-only membership, which is a bargain. And as you'll hear from John, it works for the interests of individual shareholders like you and me. And now, here's John. G'day, John. How's it going? G'day, Phil. Very good. Thanks, man. Okay, well, let's just dig into the uh, the ASA and how it helps retail shareholders. We met at the meeting at Concord, and I've got to say how much I've been enjoying going to these meetings and uh, enjoying meeting all the people and the, the collective wisdom that's there. So let's start off with the meetings when the members get together and discuss companies, investing strategies, and so forth. One of the things we... we we're dedicated to do is empowering shareholders and you can empower shareholders in a couple of ways. You know, we empower them by advocating on their behalf, going along to AGMs. But the other thing we do is we share knowledge and some people find sharing knowledge in formal courses or videos or reading books is a way they learn. Other people find talking to somebody that's done it that's been there and done that is much more useful. So, for example, Phil, there was a lady back in 2017, I think it was, that had asked us at the meeting. She had been told by her stockbroker to sell Woolworths. And she had some Woolworths shares and she didn't know what to do. At what price had she bought them at? She bought them at twenty seven bucks and yeah. they or no, thirty seven bucks and they dropped down to twenty. And so she was really worried and the stockbroker said you better sell them before they go any further. So what I did was I asked the collective wisdom of the room what they thought. Now we had about forty people in the room and everybody in the room was my vintage. And so they all had about 30 years' worth of experience. So that's more than a 1,000 years of investing experience sitting in that room. So we had a vote. Sell, as the stockbroker advised, or hold. And 39 out of the 40 voted to hold, and only one person said sell. Well, of course, ball changes occurred, management changes occurred, Woolies lifted its gain and it's back to 40 bucks. So by holding on, she doubled her money in less than four years. And so that was the power of talking to other people that got no vested interest. They're not trying to make money out of her. She was just asking other ordinary people that have got the experience, what do they think? And just avoiding that, that one mistake, she would have made quite a bit of money paid for her annual fees well over. <laughs> That's something I really enjoy is the informality of the meetings where people really chat and, um, and have quite strident opinions as well from many of them about uh, various companies. Quite right. Yeah. The, everybody has their favourites mm-hmm. and, uh, and the to and fro is really good. Yeah. And, and it, helps, it helps you understand, is a company really what you think it is? Because it's very easy to fall in love with a stock. And if you fall in love with a stock, that's the worst thing you can do. And so if somebody else says, hang on a minute, I don't agree with that, you've got that completely wrong, it makes you take a second view. And so that's really, really useful. So you mentioned before that the association also represents shareholders at company AGMs. What are some of the things that can be done on behalf of shareholders at these AGMs? Well, Generally speaking, at an AGM, the first item on the agenda will be a discussion of the annual report. Uh, It's not voted on. It's just there for discussion. And that's where our volunteers that run through the accounts in fine detail can ask questions on behalf of all small shareholders. And um, we pick up the points that the board's trying to hide. We're very disappointed at the moment with the way that companies report profits the way they see profits, not the way 
that the Companies Act sees profits, but the way they see profits. And you'll see an increasing trend for companies to report on underlying profit. And what an underlying profit is, is a profit that management likes and they strip out all the things they don't like. And so if there's a reorganisation or if there's a large asset sale, losses in relation to those items are extracted and they show an underlying profit. And guess what? Nine times out of ten, the underlying profit is significantly better than the real profit. And so we'll stand up and we'll call it out. We'll actually say, please justify the numbers that you're putting in your annual report as the profit on which you are basing the bonuses of the executives. And that's the other thing that um, is worth voting on uh, and that the association does get involved with is remuneration packages. That's one of the biggest things that um, I've noticed you take a, a keen interest in. Yes, well, as you know, the um, Warren Buffett's mate, Charlie Munger, he says, if you show me an incentive, I'll show you behaviour. And so if the board sets a decent remuneration package for the chief executive with sound hurdles, then you're going to get behaviour from the chief executive to achieve those hurdles. If you get hurdles that are just driven by sales volume, then you're going to get companies chasing sales volume, not profit. So the construction of the remuneration package of the chief executive is one of the most important things because it's what drives the whole company's behaviour. And we've seen, I'm sorry to say this, but we've seen the remuneration packages in the banks in particular set towards profitability rather than customer service. And we've seen what's happened to customer service. We all know what it's like to stand in queues at banks or wait on the telephone to get somebody to answer you. It's because the the whole organisation has been driven by a remuneration system based on profits rather than customers. Well, it went too far and now they're all retreating from that type of approach and are putting more softer KPIs, customer focus KPIs for the senior executives to follow. So hopefully we will see the behaviour of the banks and other financial institutions change as the chief executives are pursuing their bonuses, but their bonuses are based upon a much broader and wider set of parameters rather than just the profit. I want to speak about uh, proxy harvesting. This is something that the association does in terms of keeping companies to account. Can you explain what this is? Many, many small shareholders don't use their proxy forms and vote on the resolutions. The ASA can accept proxies from shareholders, whether they're members of the ASA or not, and vote on your behalf. Now, if you don't know which way to vote, just leave it open and give it to the ASA. And we are frequently in the top 10 shareholder groups at an annual general meeting voting on a resolution. And you can bet your life, whatever way we're going to vote is in the best interests of small shareholders, not necessarily the best interests of management or the board. So drawing on the thousands of years of members' experience, what advice can you give to people starting their investing journey? Phil, the most important thing about a journey, as Mr Confucius says, is you take your first step. And many people think, oh, it's too hard, I'm never going to save enough money, I won't bother. And so the advice I frequently give to younger people is start straight away. Even if you only save $20 a week, open a bank account and put $20 a week every week into that bank account. And once you get to $500, go and buy a parcel of shares. Now you can buy BHP or CSL or CBA, whatever you like, but buy a top company and just buy $500 worth and keep saving. And $20 a week, what's that? Four cups of coffee, five cups of coffee. It's not so hard. And after five years, and I know five years seems a long time if you're a young person, but after five years, you'll have 10 parcels of the best shares in Australia 
probably worth double what you originally paid. Now, that that makes you feel good, that you've got 10 parcels, and if you keep saving in the same way, just $20 a week, by the time you get to my age, you'll have $280,000 worth of shares. And it's a staggering number, and 20 bucks a week is nothing, but people don't do it. I can't understand why they don't do it. Peer pressure is a, a, a big thing, and I know that young people, I see it all the time when I'm on the train or on the bus, that people are listening to the AirPods. They're listening. And I thought about that, and I, I see so many young people with AirPods. And they're 300 bucks a pair compared to the um, earphones that I use, which are 30 bucks a pair. <laughs> now, that $300, if instead of buying them, you bought a parcel of shares, 300 bucks worth of shares, and it just grows at the same rate that shares have grown over the last 40 years. So last year they were up 20%, the year before that were up nothing. So over the two years you're on an average up 10%. Well, if it just keeps growing like that, in 40 years' time, the $300 will be over 6500 That's a $6,500 set of earphones. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to dig in a little bit here because um, it was funny. Just, just last night I was read, I've been reading a biography of uh, Warren Buffett oh. and how he doesn't <clears throat> like the measure of EBITDA, which is, if you could explain what EBITDA is and how that disguises so many sins. Yes, well, the... Um as you know, profit, the profit from which dividends are paid is a profit after you've paid tax, after you've paid interest, after you've paid depreciation. But EBITDA is before all of those items. So it's the profit before you replenish your assets, which is depreciation. A company must use its depreciation to keep its assets fresh. And if it doesn't, it's degrading its asset base. It's got to pay interest to the banks. It's borrowing money. It's got to pay interest. And, of course, it's got to pay tax. We small shareholders have all paid tax, most of us, all of our lives, on our salaries. And it's not fair that many companies organise their affairs so they don't pay tax. So they're in our community selling products in our community, but they're not paying the right amount of tax. We don't like that. We prefer companies to do the right thing and pay their tax. And so EBITDA is it's, it's similar to cash flow, but there are you've got to keep your assets going, you've got to keep your bankers happy, and you've got to keep the government happy and pay the right amount of tax. That's interesting. I mean... Uh... In the world of red meat capitalism, you'd, you'd think that minimising your tax would be a good thing. No. I mean, corporations are part of our society. Yeah. We, you don't... If you've got a mate that you go drinking down the pub with and he's gloating all the time, he's not paying any tax, are you going to think that's a good bloke? I don't think so. I think somebody that pays their fair share... We all live in this society, so we all need to pay our part of providing the money the government needs to keep our society a happy place. And um, I'm, I'm disappointed that many companies, and we all know which ones I'm talking about, the, <laughs> the major companies in America in social media that manage to manipulate their profits and put them into low tax-paying jurisdictions, well... I personally don't think that's the way to go, and uh, in the end, the public will react against that. John Cowling, thank you very much for coming and joining us. Thanks, Phil. Shares for Beginners is for information and educational purposes only. It isn't financial advice, and you shouldn't buy or sell any investments based on what you've heard here. Any opinion or commentary is the view of the speaker only, not Shares for Beginners. This podcast doesn't replace professional advice regarding your personal financial needs, circumstances, or current situation. Thanks to Christopher Soulos for music production with that special Greekalicious flavour. Remember, music always flows, even when the money won't. <laughs>